Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. My name is Tyler with Bedford Camera and Video. This series is all about image makers, how they made their image, what types of cameras they're using, lenses, and their thought processes behind how to create these images. And our first guest, I want to introduce a good friend of mine. This is Max Grubb. Hey Max, thanks for joining us and we appreciate you coming in and being our first guest. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and the type of photography you shoot? Yeah, Tyler, thanks for having me on. So I am a wedding photographer in Northwest Arkansas. I've been doing that for just shy of a decade now. And uh, the majority of my work tends to be portraiture, weddings, and family photography. So wedding photography was not always the goal. I uh, really was, uh, when I first started out in doing photography, I did sports photography. I was in high school, so I did yearbook. I was the one that could figure out how not to uh, have shutter drag. So I could actually freeze the motion of the, the subject. So I did a lot of the sports photography, ended up doing a lot of senior portraiture, went on to college, did uh, undergrad at John Brown University doing photography and graphic design as a minor. And when um, the time came, I thought I was gonna be doing fashion photography, um, commercial photography, more on the, the personable sides, so more on the humanity side of commercial photography, and then uh, graduated and realized just having a diploma didn't mean you were getting a job. And so because of that, you know, I had six months left in Arkansas, uh, put out a couple feelers, and I ended up working for a company for eight years. And through that, I did wedding photography, commercial photography, but the, the majority of the work was wedding photography. So in college, I said I'd never be a wedding photographer. Uh, I said, It'd have to be drastic if that happened. Ended up shooting my first wedding and never looked back. Uh, it was one of those things that you have, um, you know, details, portraiture, you have the stress and the, the juggling of timelines, all of that stuff. I'm very much an ADD person. So being able to maneuver through a day like that and not being stale and doing the same thing over and over and over really drew me into it. And you know, you had to be good at a hundred things and not great at just one, but good at a lot of them. So that was what, what kind of drew me into weddings and then I ended up staying, so. And it's an event and you can't do it again or you can't call them a week later and go, "Yep, hey, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't there for the first kiss. Could we mock this up and do this again? For sure, yeah, it's definitely, there's, there's definitely a level of this has to be captured the first time. And if you don't, that, that stress is what, one, drives me on a wedding day. At this point, 10 years in, that's not really what keeps me awake at night. The stress of that has become kind of normal place. You can, you can understand when the officiant starts to say certain words or the inflection in his voice, you're like, oh, the kiss is about to happen. I should probably get in place. Or um, you kind of have a timeline. You've got your idea of when things are gonna happen throughout a day. And um, my biggest thing is I really want people's weddings to be about their day. I want their photos to be about their day, not their day to be about their photos. And so pushing into on the front end, making sure that we've built their timelines around, around that flexibility and around the ability to be able to look at their day and be like, hey, we're about to do your first look, just stand in that beautiful light. That way I'm not like, hey, let's redo that. I missed your emotion. Instead, I'm just, that's the pretty light. Let's make sure it happens there. And then when it happens, it's natural. It's actually caught. It's actually the real emotion that was seen. It was the real uh, event, the real moment. And so, you know, early on, there were a few missed things, but the, the further I get into it, not to, not to say it can't happen, but I do my best to eliminate the, the lack of catching those moments. Definitely. And something that I, I've heard from other couples and, and, you know, being that you and I are both married, so we understand the process, we understand, uh, I guess that, that euphoric feeling of being there on the day and, and sure you worry about things on the day, but you shouldn't because you're the ones getting married. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had friends tell me, if I were to do it all over again, I would delegate this and I would do this because I don't wanna worry about it. I don't wanna stress about it. But I think it's great that there are a lot of good photographers out there doing this event type of work and they're just taking the pressure off of their mm -hmm. customer and they're gonna remember that stress was taken off of me. I could I could be there with my mom. I could be there with uh, my my in laws. You know. Yep. Yeah. The the thing for me is, I if you've been a couple of mine, you've heard it. But show up, look hot, get married. Let let the people you've hired to do the jobs they've they're here to do. Let them do it. 
if you've hired the right crew, if you've hired the right vendors that you that you mesh with, that you vibe really well with, the whole point there is like you've done the homework on the upfront so that when you get to the day, you just get to enjoy it. You get to you get to live it. You don't get to I don't know. You, you get to live it so you don't have to architect it on the day of. Um, you you get to actually when hey it starts to sprinkle. My photographer has been here for 10 years. He's done a wedding in every type of environment you can imagine. I trust that he's got a plan. Um, and then that way you get to remember your flower girl dancing around, throwing, you know, throwing your veil over her head or mom, you know, putting you into your dress for the first time or dad buttoning your boutonniere onto your jacket. Like all those things become the memories that when you see my photo, you remember the emotion rather than when you see the photo, you see what it took to get that photo. Um, that's my job to, to know what it takes to get the photo. It's your job to live it. So exactly. Yeah. What's one image that sticks in your mind that is an image reminds you of a time you were learning, whether that's you're learning the mechanics of photography or you were learning how to uh, react to people or, or be around people, how to direct them into the composition you want. What's something like that moment? Uh, what's, what's an image of that type of moment that sticks in your mind? Well, you know, there's a couple different images that I, I fall back on. One, as far as like, just one image I look on and realize like, uh, one, how far I've come, but two, also how the simplicity of just being willing to learn allows you the time to get the images that, you know, affect you later on. So one of those images super early on, uh, I grew up overseas. So one of those images was on a barbed wire fence and there was a raindrop coming off the fence that I shot in macro. So I shot it on an old camera that my dad gave me and that image was barbed wire fence, raindrop falling off of it at sunset and the earth was inverted inside of the raindrop. Super cool, really cool moment for me. I look back on that image, I honestly don't know where that image is, but if you were to ask me about images I took when I was first getting started, that's the one that stood out. I have no idea why, but it's always the one that's kind of ingrained in my head. Secondly, uh, it's less about a time that I learned like how to work with people or how to like work with my gear. I think it was a wedding in 2017. I got, it was my first destination wedding overseas. Um, and so we went, I was down on the, the um, Baja Peninsula down in Cabo. And this photo is of the couple walking out what looks like just off into the sunset. Um, there's a, they're standing out on these cliffs and it's at sunset. And I mean, just the two of them, they're like this big in the photo. It's amazing. I think in that moment, I realized that there was never going to be something that like, hey, now you're a professional or hey, you know, now that you've done this, you've made it. Hey, now that you're, you don't really have those career milestones, I would say, unless you make them yourself. And for me, that was a milestone. I guess I didn't really realize that I had in my head mm -hmm. was to be able to travel and do this. Uh, growing up, I traveled all the time. And so that was the first wedding to me that told me like, hey, you can travel anywhere in the world and do the job that you're doing. And you can still have that desire and that want to travel, but you can still give the emotion, the product, the enjoyment to your clients that you do here in the States. And so um, that's a photo for me that I will always fall back on. I think at this point, everyone on my, on my Instagram or my socials are tired of seeing that photo because I post it <laughs> all the time um, or share it all the time or it's the background, you know, it's a, a header on my website. Um, and, you know, I shot it in 2017. Uh, but to, to that effect, a lot of what I do now is indicative of what I wish I had done at that wedding, mm -hmm. looking back on it. Um, so I've done, I did a lot at that wedding that I was super proud of, but looking back on it, there's a lot from that wedding that I wish I had done differently. And so um, I think that would be the, the big thing for me is it's less about an image that I learned a lot in, but it's an image of a day or an experience that I've grown from. Um, and, and it brings a, a sweet place of both innocence, re remembrance of where I was and kind of how to push from there. Everybody views the world differently and everybody has a different preference on focal length. What is a go-to focal length or a, uh, a preference that you have either wide or long when you're shooting? Yeah, so I think for me, it's changed over the years uh, and it depends a little bit on situation, but I think for now uh, in the present, my, my biggest 
go-to lens is going to be the Nikon uh, 50 millimeter. Their mirrorless 50 millimeter, the 1.2. Absolutely love that lens. That 1.2 just makes the background so buttery and it is tack sharp every time. Uh, you can grab focus on an eye, walking down an aisle, low light, and I don't have to guess whether or not it's gonna be a missed focus. So I really love the 50. Um, and I think it's because of the 1.2. Uh, you know, I've, I've had other, other 50s and they just never really spoke to me that way. Um, so over my career, I've really kind of gone through the, the 85 millimeter, focal range, the 35 and the 50. So I would say those are gonna be my three main prime lenses in my bag. Um, right now I'm gravitating towards the, the Nikon 50 millimeter for their mirrorless lineup. And those three seem to be classic lenses for, uh, not so much for like speaking event, but specifically for weddings, it seems like those three, those, that trinity of lenses seems to be the go-to for a lot of people, at least in this area. Yeah, and, and I think the reason for that is is one, you know, being able to have that that you know being able to open that wide open on an f-stop is nice being able to not be restricted by like hey it's low light i i need that ability to have more light in my lens you know i think that's why most people aren't going to jump to a, a variable zoom lens because you're usually stuck at an f4 or a 2.8 and like 2.8 doesn't sound that bad but when you're looking at outdoor reception, only twinkle lights. If you want it to feel like what they wanted their wedding to feel like, you're probably not gonna to bring in too many lights. You can, and I do, um, but having that 1.2 is really nice. And so um, I'm both excited for the Nikon Z, uh, their 85 millimeter 1.2 they've just announced. Very excited to get an 85 back in my bag. Um, but right now, you know, I, I kind of sit between the 35 millimeter and the 80, or the 35 millimeter and the 50 millimeter. Um, that 35, I'm becoming more in love with it. I think for a long time people did a 35 because they were too worried about missing something in frame, um, and so I kind of shied away from it because I wanted to I wanted to challenge myself and my view on things. But I'm really getting back to that 35 and viewing it in a different light and being able to play with it again and, and have some fun. Mm -hmm. Now you've been shooting on the Nikon Z9 for a little bit of time, at least. I'm not. I can't remember when you when you got yours in, uh, but it seems like you've been really enjoying that that camera. It's been a very popular camera for us at, at Bedford selling them, and and a lot of people have seemed to take into it a lot and, and enjoy the way it shoots, enjoy uh, its capabilities. Tell us about your experiences with the Nikon Z9. Yeah. So pre Nikon, I was shooting Fuji. Love the Fuji line. I had the GFX system, still have the GFX system, love it. I think for me though, I was finding that I needed more speed. I needed more reaction from my camera. Um, yeah, you can, you can set up a lot of things. You can be prepared for a lot of things. Um, but that Nikon, the, the focus on it, I can turn it on and focus within what feels like a second. Um, and so I don't ever feel like I'm missing something. I'm not running through battery crazy hours in the day because I don't have to just leave it on all the time. I can turn it on and react really quickly. And so uh, for me, I got the Z9 in June of 2022. Okay. Uh, May to June of 2022. So not quite a year. Yeah, I'm coming up on a year um, and I have not put the thing down. I absolutely love it. Uh, I love the fact that there's no blackout in the screen when you're shooting. Yeah. It's huge. Um, I, You know, it's always been a thing that you have blackout after taking a photo. Mm -hmm mirrorless it was less but there was still black out there so to be able to jump into a z9 and into a camera that as i'm shooting i can watch the reactions still happening and and really capture like i've seen everything that's going on and i've captured exactly what i wanted rather than taking a photo seeing a little bit of a blackout and oh that was the moment that the bride wiped the tear off her, of her mom's face as she was getting her dress so for me i've really enjoyed that I love the full body frame again, right? I love being able to have the built-in uh, vertical grip, the battery that's larger, the battery that does better lifetime. Um, the amount of frames per second is dangerous because I don't need that many, uh, especially not for portraiture. And when I shoot on that, 
my back end process for culling is a nightmare. Um, so I'm still trying to gauge uh, those things, but I love it. The video capability has been amazing to be able to play around with, um, being able to do, you know, interviews with videos and stuff like that. It's been in very impressive with its tracking and its eye capability. So I personally have not looked back, really loved the change into the Z9. Um, I'm looking forward to the, the more robust lens line that they're building. Um, right now they don't have a ton that speaks to me, um, but they have a lot in the pipeline that I'm very excited for. Including that the 8512, right? 8512, there's been some rumor of a possible 35, a possible 135. So um, I, I'm not a big 7200 zoom guy. I, I shoot it when I need it, but um, it's one of those lenses I'd rather rent from you guys than purchase it because I don't need it all the time. And so um, I'm really excited for that 135 though, to, have a, uh, to be able to open a little bit more wide open, to be able to get the distance that I need. Most of what I'm shooting, I don't need more than a 135. So uh, when, they, when they had that on there, the little diagram of potential lenses coming out, you know, whenever they say they come out, I'm very excited for the 135 and the 35. I think with those two lenses and then that 85 that just came out, I'll be, in a place that I won't need a lens for a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that, that's an interesting point with uh, the capability, but what I'm thinking of is the resolution. So it's a 50 megapixel sensor. I know that's becoming more popular in the, the high speed, uh, high res cameras, like you know we have the R5 uh, and then the, you know, the Alpha One with Sony. Yeah. It's really neat to see that we're seeing not only high performance, because usually that meant high frame rate at 20 megapixels oh yeah or 16 or 12 you know like that was the the d5 was i think i think the d5 was 24 and then the d4 was 16. Right. um so like yeah that allowed your capability in low light to be better but with the new technology like even at 50 megapixels i'm willing to jump to 6400 iso and not worry jump up to 12,800 iso and not worry again because it brings in those emotions to to my clients to bring them back into what their day was. It was dark, it was a dark reception or it was a dark ceremony or, um, and still having an image that's usable and quality, but not one that's like, well, it's unusable because I had to go that high. Right. And even on the post-production side in terms of the resolution, how often do you crop in? Like what, how often do you need to extremely crop in? I know you have that ability yeah. to, and I mean, heck, you know, you and I've been shooting on anywhere from 10 to 20, 25 megapixels. Yeah. And it's it's a different workflow, but it is nice to have that flexibility. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there is some cropping. I'll say I don't I don't use it to its fullest capability. Um, I really try and get the to save myself time on the back end, I really try and get those photos out of camera. Um, I feel like a lot of people say that just to to toot their own horn, but like I truly do it to save myself time on the back end. Um, but yeah, let's say, you know, they're exchanging rings at the altar and I've got my 50 on and I don't want to pass the front three rows because that's where family is. I don't want to interrupt all that. Yeah, being able to crop in super nice um, and, and being able to take one photo and use it for two or three different photos because of the cropping capability is it's definitely a game changer. You know, I remember shooting um, APS-C sensors and not being able to, to crop at all on those. Um, and then those got a little bit better and you could crop a little bit more and then going back to full frame and, and having that capability going to, you know, fuller frame or medium format or whatever they're wanting to call it these days. And yeah, there's capability everywhere. And, you know, I think when I chose the Z9 over the GFX, I lost some of those capabilities in the crop because, you know, 100 megapixel versus 50, I'm gonna have more capability in the GFX. But to me, I was seeing that I wasn't using it as much of as much as I could have. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as big of a loss to me, but I really do love being able to like, hey, let me zoom in on the rings on the hand, you know, or let's shoot a ring detail shot on a 50 where I can't shoot macro, but I can get that detail because I can crop in later. Um, so it's definitely allowed me to downsize my bag and still do the quality of work that my clients are used to. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of processing other than cropping, uh, I mean, we're talking like saturation and contrast changes. Tell me how much processing you do in general. For sure. So my biggest thing is I won't manipulate the human body, right? Um, so if, if you've got a blemish as far as like, hey, I've got some acne today that I don't usually have, 
I'll clean that stuff up. But as far as like, hey, I'm 10 pounds more than I wanna be. Well, we're just gonna do a lot of posing in a way that shows you in the most flattering light. Um, so it's gonna represent you during this time. It's gonna represent you during this stage of life, but it's gonna be a, a glorified version without me having to manipulate your body in post-production. Um, and and I, I really stick to that because we all ebb and we all flow, right? And so um, we're all on a journey and I'd, I'd rather not fake who you were at this stage in your life, but capture who you are in this stage of life. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I don't do a lot of body manipulation. Most of what I do is color touching and, and toning and making sure, you know, hey, I'm gonna pull down the highlight a little bit here. I'm gonna pull up the shadows a little bit here. But uh, for the most part, it's not that much of a shift um, from what I'm getting in camera to what I'm delivering to my clients. Um, it's kind of just a nice gloss over the top of the image. And so um, it does take me a little bit of time. I think the biggest, the biggest portion of my post-processing is calling through all my images and making sure that I'm giving the correct images and not just over oversaturating my clients with too many images. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I really think that post-production is where your style is created, um, whether that be minimalistic, whether that be straight out of camera, whether that be, you know, going all in and, and fixing every blemish, doing body manipulation, whatever that looks like. I do think that having that final touch on your post-production is what makes your photography you um, and, and what allows people to be able to pull up an image and be like, that's a max image, right? That's a Tyler image um, because of the consistency there and because of the way that you like to do those things. And so for me, um, it's one of those things I, I don't farm out to other people um, just because that is like, it's my final grasp on my product that I'm giving a client. Um, and it's what they've hired me for, right? They've hired me, they've hired me to get the experience. They've hired me to get the product. They've hired me to, um, really get what they've seen online or get what they've seen from their friends' weddings or from uh, their their wedding vendor who showed them photos from a wedding that they worked with me. And so once you start to farm that out to me, that's when you start to lose the the credibility there with your clients and that and that ability to say, no, 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 your photos are all hand touched by me. And so, um, yeah, that's that it is a big part of my process. But as far as how much work I do to it, it's not a ton. Um, I've got I've got my presets that I use and I've got my my stuff that uh, are my go to. And then from there, I tweak it. But yeah, I've got my base that I start with. So as time goes on, uh, you know, things change, uh, styles change. How are you making sure that you are continually growing, you're continually changing with the times, uh, but also creating a somewhat of a timeless look in your, in your client's work? Yeah, so I think for me, the biggest thing is to never, I mean, yeah, really being stale. Um, once I become complacent in what I'm giving my clients, that's when I hit that point of stale, right? Um, that's when I get, I get bored um, I start to just coast through a wedding day. I don't get excited. I don't, I don't try new things. And so for me, a, a big thing that I've been doing is just research. Just, you know, a lot of us want to doom scroll through Instagram or doom scroll through social media and just be blind and numb to what we're seeing. I think over the, the last couple of years, I've really made it a point to instead of doom scrolling, um, I'm typing in hashtags and I'm, I'm viewing people's work that I admire. I'm viewing new work. I'm viewing new ways of seeing wedding day. Um, I'm seeing things that I don't like mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna steer away from. I'm seeing things that I do like and then I'm gonna dig in deeper. Um, and then I also think, you know, there's, there's a thing where 70% of what I'm gonna give my client is what they've seen from me before. And 30% is the things that I wanna try and the things that I'm, that I'm excited about trying. Um, because again, the, they're hiring me for my art which that's hard to say that what I do is art, but also what I do is a job. Um, and blending those two and not losing sight of like, oh, well, they didn't like my art this time. That's not a reflection of me, that's a reflection of my art. That's a really hard, fine line to deal with. And so for me, I really try to, the majority of my shoot is gonna be what they've seen. Um, and then also the big thing for me is that 30% that I'm trying is posting it, is showing it to people, is getting it out in front of the potential new clients um, and allowing that space to be not just 30 
70 during the shoot, but 30, 70 on the opposite and what my clients are seeing. Mm -hmm. So my clients are getting the gallery of all the photos that they love with some new experimental stuff, right? And so if they post all the stuff that they love, the experimental wasn't for them, that's okay. Um, now, if you ever come back to me as a client, I know the things you like, right? right. Um, I'm not going to shy away from that. That is my work. I've done that work. I'm not afraid of that work. Um, but I also think moving forward, my clients are going to see the things that I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. And when your clients see that you're excited about it, they get excited about it right. because the reason they're coming to you is because you're so tied to your art. And so, yeah, I think, I think the big thing for me is instead of just doom scrolling, I'm really finding some, some people, some photographers, whether that be in the wedding world, whether that be in the, the fashion world or the commercial world that are doing things or truly now in the world that we live in, it's going to be the influencer world, right? Like right. influencers now are no longer just taking photos of their cell phone. They're going out and hiring full production crews to shoot them as influencers. And so why not take some ideas from that? Because not just brands, but like my clients are on Instagram. My clients are probably following these influencers. They're following it for a reason. And it's not just because they like the products they're getting. It's because it's visually catching. And so um, I'm really doing my best to not just doom scroll and, and going off of social and going into their websites and deep diving and seeing how their clients are responding to it. And so um, I think a lot of research. Um, I also take a lot, of, a lot of inspiration from actual cinematography and less photography. Mm -hmm. And so um, my wife gets a little frustrated with me, but I, she says I've seen everything under the sun. And the reason for that is I'm, I'm hungry to see how people shoot things and get ideas and um, see how to tell a story and, and the story between a couple visually in motion is totally different than you would in still. Mm -hmm. And so um, something I'm seeing right now is like the thing that I'm being drawn to is not all for the last 10 years, it's been my clients as close as they could get to each other, right? Because you're in love, you, you need to be close. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at if you look at cinema and you look at the storytelling of a, a relationship on screen, a lot of times they're in separate places, either in the room or on on a, a couch or in a in a scene. They're separate from each other, and there are the moments where they're together and they're um, they're as one. But there's a lot of times where they're living their own life. And how does that now tie into living a life together? And so playing with that, experimenting with that, um, and that's kind of the, the new stage that I'm in, but also um, staying true to what my clients have come to love. And so that, that fine balance of shifting mm -hmm. um, and slowly posting new things and slowly putting out their new things and then posting three or four of the same and then sharing two of some new things and then posting two some old things and, mm -hmm. and seeing that response and slowly getting, you know, the people coming to me conditioned to seeing the change there. Mm -hmm. Do you have an embarrassing story about when you were getting started in photography and what life lesson did you learn? Oh, uh, you know, there's a couple that come to mind and they might not be when I was first starting out. They might be scattered throughout my whole um, career at this point. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing embarrassing for me, not in, not necessarily embarrassing for my client. Um, but you know, I really try and do a good job on the upfront with all my clients, especially when it comes to family dynamics, because you never know family dynamics. And that is one place that can get really touchy. Um, but that's also one place that, um, can, you can lose a, a groom and a bride yeah. <laughs> on a wedding day. Like, um, when family dynamics get hairy, if we come to family photos after that, it could be done for and the rest of the day is real weird. And so, um, I was actually at a wedding a couple weeks ago and I was doing full family photos and I had them all lined up the way that, uh, they came in and the way that I called them. And so we were, we were done with that photo and we were breaking out certain people that we didn't need in the photo anymore. And I asked for grandma and grandpa to go stand back on the side they were just on. And grandma made it very apparent that that was no longer her husband. Um, no. And uh, hadn't been for 40 years. And it was, a, it was a moment that the whole family heard and that I had to take on the brunt of my chin and like play off casually. Uh, and not let it just dissolve from there and just like ruin the day. Um, but thankfully we all laughed it off. Uh, and thankfully grandpa didn't really hear the comment because I'm pretty sure he was mostly deaf. Um, grandma 
uh, made it enjoyable and laughable. But at the same time, it was like those moments that I'm like, did you know better? Like, ask these questions out of the upfront. Um, and so there's always those moments when, right, you get into like the, the routine of things and you just call things out. Um, another one, you know, I was on my way to a shoot early on and I used to do a two card carrier system. So used cards and not used cards. And I grabbed the wrong case because they look the same. And I got about 10 minutes from the shoot and realized I grabbed the wrong card case um, and having to like work that on the fly. Um, and like, where can I go? I got to swing in a Walmart and grab an SD card because like, <laughs> I'm, that's the only thing nearby. Um, and now I'm shooting, you know, on a 32 gig SD card that I don't trust and that is not the quality that I'm used to. And how do I make this work? How do I not go in panic? How does my client not know this? Um, so there's, there's things uh, and things that you always learn and things that you get better at. Um, and I've made it a very good point not to make that the case anymore. And so, um, you know, that was, I think that was within the first year um, of doing this. And so there's just those things, right? I think we all have that fear as we go into a shoot that like, oh, I need to check my bag one more time because did I put my camera in it? Yeah, I checked it 16 times before I left the house, but <laughs> somewhere between here and there, the, you know, the magical leprechaun took it out of my bag. Like, that's not the case. Um, and so, you know, just just creating those systems that are maybe not foolproof, but that become second nature. And so you just are always doing what you need to be doing. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we've all got the stories. We're all human. And um, I'm sure there's a million more that I could tell. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's learning how to not, for me, it was the learning how to just move past it instantly and worry about it later rather than getting stuck in it and spiraling in the moment. <laughs> That's great. And, and I wish we could do a whole hour just on stories because I'm sure you have, because I mean, we're all people, we're all different and we all have our quirks. And I'm, I'm sure in this industry, you meet a large variety of personalities oh, yeah. and and family dynamics, I didn't even think about that because you don't know these people. You, you might know a little bit about the couple, but you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know the extended family and so and so doesn't like so and so because of something that happened 40 years ago. 40 years yeah. ago or five days ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, working in the stores, we see a lot of younger folks come in. We see high school students come in, early college come in, and they're getting into their career or, or may. Or, or, or are thinking about photography or video as a career path. What is some advice you would give to either your younger self or to a uh, beginner coming into this field or, or wanting to think about it as a, as a career path? What, what advice would you give to them? Yeah, I think for me, uh, try it all, right? Um, don't be afraid to step in and try something just because you've never done it before. Um, if, I, if I had been as stubborn as I said I was going to be, I wouldn't have been in weddings for 10 years, right? So um, I said that was something I'd never do. I'm going to be a sports photographer. I'm going to be a fashion photographer. I'm going to be X, Y, Z. Um, but love, shooting love all day, there's no way. Uh, and and so the second I did it, I, I fell into it instantly. And it was one of those things like, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would say don't pigeonhole yourself young. Um, really be be willing to try it all and be willing to say yes but also know your limitations within that to some extent. Um, don't say yes and say, yeah, I'm a professional at that. Say yes and say, hey, this isn't something I usually do, but I'm willing to try it um, if you're willing to give me the, the latitude to do that. And so, um, yeah, I would say just try a little bit of everything. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of us get um, right on the line of I'm going to do it, but what if I fail? Um, I, I think the thing that I've learned in the throughout the course of my life is failure is only as strong as you let it, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you if you let failure stop you, it's now a failure. Um, if, if you fail at something and move past it, it's now just a stepping stone. It wasn't a failure, it's a lesson to learn from. Mm -hmm. And so that's the biggest thing that, you know, retrospectively looking back on, I wish I had failed early on. I wish I had had a couple more of those stepping stones. Um, there are, you know, some things in my, my early on in my career path that I had allowed me to to stay stale because I allowed it to be a failure um, or I allowed it to be a fear because of what failure would look like. And so I think that's the big thing for me is like, don't be afraid to, to create a couple stepping stones along the way. Well, and you always remember those because gosh, I've, I've had my own too. And 
when I go back into that scenario, I think, yeah, I, I completely messed that up. Mm -hmm. And had I gone the total opposite direction, had I, you know, uh, had I been either more prepared or reacted differently, I would have had a lot more success. But it's just always on the for forefront of your mind going, you know, you're able to cull through all the possibilities. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's right. Hindsight's 2020. But when you see, when you look back at those things that like that was a failure, I can guarantee you're never going to let it be a failure again. But if it had been a success, you wouldn't think twice about it because it's one of those like, yeah, I did it. That's yep. Yeah, check, check the box. Right. Um, and there are the big milestones, of course, with success that you look back on. And you're like, man, I can't wait for the next success. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like a lot of times we we look back on the things that we failed, failed at. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the things that fuel us to never do that again or to always grow, to get a little bit better because that failure is what drives us. And so if you're afraid of that failure, you're, not, you're, you're gonna pigeonhole yourself or you're gonna cap yourself because you're gonna stop reaching for that next thing because, well, if I fail at it, then everyone thinks I'm a, a failure. Mm -hmm. Well, no, if you fail at it and then you pick back up, everyone's gonna look at it and be like, no matter what, they kept pushing through. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, that'd be my biggest advice. Don't be afraid to, to fall a little bit and get back up. Or look where they've come. If they've known you from 10 years ago and you made exactly. all those mistakes or you were totally green at something and they go, he's, he's built a whole business or he's yeah. been able to photograph these people, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. So what's one accessory that you always have with you on a shoot? <sighs> that one is easy for me. Um, Outside of the, the gear talk, outside of cameras, outside of lenses, memory cards, all that, the one thing I have on me with every single shoot is gonna be a whole fast strap. Um, I carry those with me everywhere. I actually, for I think the better part of the last six years, have had it with me on every shoot. And I did a wedding this year, this last year in 2022 when I forgot my hold fast. And it was the weirdest thing. It's like being a right-handed person and trying to write with your left hand. Mm -hmm. um, instantly, you're like, I know how to do this. How do I do it without this thing, right? Uh, and so for me, it's gonna be a hold fast strap. Um, is it the double strap? It is, so I shoot, I shoot the double strap. On the right-hand side, I have my camera. On the left-hand side, I actually have a bag that carries, it's a hold fast bag. It carries lenses, so it carries any additional lenses that I'm gonna carry, memory cards and an extra battery. That way, you know, I can have a hub for my gear on a wedding day, but a lot of the wedding day is moving. And so I'm not gonna wanna carry my full Pelican case. I'm not gonna wanna carry my full backpack. You know what I mean? So for me, having that extra bag on my left-hand side allows me to just run and gun throughout pretty much an entire day, or at least from start to ceremony end, uh, I can run and gun and do what I need to. And so for me, it's gonna be a whole fast trap. Yeah. That's interesting. I, Cause I, I immediately thought you were having two bodies. Cause I, I've seen most people use a 35 on this side and an 85 on this side and they just grab as what grab as needed but that, that's that's interesting that you have this i'm i'm thinking of you know a video game where you go into that menu and you're mm -hmm. like okay do, which which weapon do i need and you pull it out i think it's interesting that you have it on this side yeah. uh, but then you have your your main weapon your your camera on this side but you can switch those lenses on the fly because i've always wondered that you know do you just have like one little pouch and you have one lens and you swap it out but uh, like how many lenses do you normally have in that so saddlebag kind of thing? I can usually fit two additional lenses, my memory card case, so that if for any reason I've shot through a memory card, I can quickly trade out, um, and then an additional battery. And now that's with the case being at its smallest. I can extend that case so it actually is up on the bottom and it extends down. Mm -hmm. That can that can be a 7200 with a 85 and the the memory cards and the the battery in it. So um, it's a pretty versatile bag. Uh, during ceremonies, I'll shoot two cameras. Um, I'll shoot, you know, one that's gonna be set for the groom's face as the bride comes down the aisle, and then one that's set for everyone coming down the aisle. So I will still be able to have a, a second camera on that side, but for the most part, throughout the, the majority of the day, I carry just an additional extra lenses, extra cards, batteries. Now, we talked about tangible. What is something intangible, something not gear related that you always keep with you on a shoot? I think for me, the biggest thing is, you know, growing up cross-culturally, I was ingrained in a lot of different cultures and seeing the clash of what those cultures could be or seeing the differences in those cultures and seeing what was important, what wasn't important. And so I think that gave me a really broad ability to walk into situations and be a chameleon. 
Um, and so I think that's a, a big tangible, well not a big intangible for me on a wedding day is being able to walk in and be what they need me to be. Um, and to them, it feels so authentic. Um, and to those who may really know me um, or know who I am outside of my, my job and my career, they may not see that side of me. Um, or they may know like, ah, that's not, that's not the real max, but that's the max they need him to be for now. And so I think for me, that's my biggest intangible is being able to walk in and just be a chameleon in, in the situations that I'm in, you know, from shooting a, a country wedding at, on farmland to shooting, you know, country club, New York City, very affluent weddings. Like, I have to fit in both worlds and how do you do that and be both true to yourself and also be true to the moment. And so um, I think that would be my biggest intangible is just having an open mind and, and being who they need me to be in the moment. Um, whether that's their best friend, whether that's the, the bad guy because so-and-so wants something and we don't have the time for it. Or um, if that's the fixer, if that's the photographer, if that's the, um, you know, fix my bouquet, like whatever that looks like walking in and, and not having a preconceived notion of what I was gonna be that day and being what they need me to be. Mm -hmm. What makes wedding photography and engagement photography different from that of uh, product photography or senior photos or, or other photography like that? How do you approach it differently? Yeah, so when it comes to product photography, there's gonna be a lot of like, there's a lot of stipulations when it comes from a corporate side of things, right? They need it at a, certain size, they need certain parameters that you have to fit within. And so, you know, when it comes into it, there's a lot of pre-production when it goes into those things, a lot of prep, a lot of setting up lights, a lot of things of that nature. And when it comes to senior photography, you know, this is mommy and daddy's sweet baby child. Um, and so there's a lot of emotion when it comes to that. And so I would say engagements and weddings, the way that it differs for me is, you're meeting people on a pinnacle, right? Um, this is the happiest day of their life. This is X, Y, Z. Um, and so there is a lot of emotion there, but it's very easy for that emotion to just be euphoric in a sense. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of just happiness throughout the whole process. Um, whereas product photography, it's a little bit lifeless. It's a little bit, there's, there's less of that joy. There's less of that excitement there's more it's just a rigid structure of like this is what we need this is when we need it thank you bye the way that i approach you know wedding and engagements is just making sure that i'm on the energy level they need to be at so if they're super pumped about this great if they're a little bit more like relaxed chill like whatever i'm going to be relaxed and chill whereas when it comes to corporate and like more the the product style you're essentially a product number that they call mm. when they need it and so um, there's just a different verbiage and a different, again, right, that chameleon, there's a different version of me that they get than my wedding clients are going to get. Um, not to say there's not professionalism in weddings and in engagements, but you can be a person. You can be who you are. Mm -hmm. In the product world, there's, there's less of that. They don't care who you are. They care what the end product looks like. Right. Um, and, they, and they don't see that who you are affects that end product. Um, and so I think it's, it's learning when to mask those things. It's learning when to use those things to your advantage. And so, um, for me, a lot of, a lot of the difference is going to be the, the upfront prep time, um, the gear that's associated with it. You know, gear, there's a lot more gear when it comes to your, your product stuff. And then, um, really to me, that's the reason that I, I shoot more weddings. I shoot more couples is I love the, I love the personability that you get with, with, the career. I love the, the way that I'm learning about your life. I'm going to be a part of your life. If you want me to be from this stage until I'm no longer doing this, you know, like we've got, I've got couples that I've shot engagements, um, proposals to engagement mm -hmm. photos, to wedding, to, you know, baby announcement, to first born, to second through. born, to, you same know, people. yeah, just same people. Um, because, now, when you show your family, this is our family. It's not just this is our family, but this is our family from day one to day now. Mm -hmm. And it's all the same. It all feels like our family. It's all told from the same voice. Um, and so to me, there's, there's power in that. And so I really enjoy, you know, 
once you're once you're a client, you're now a friend. Um, yeah. And so with a with a with product, that's not the case, right? Like, this is now an Amazon photo that's on Amazon, and I'll never see it again. Um, there's not much of a signature, not much of no, a you, you're putting yourself on it. There's there's zero me when it comes to product photography. Um, in the in the traditional sense, I think lifestyle product photography. There's a lot more ability to be that way. Again, I think that. Um, the social media influencer product mm -hmm. stuff, I think that that tends to be a little bit more who you are, what your sure. voice is, what your look is, and the reason they're wanting to hire you is because of the face you've put on. And so um, I really think there's there are different avenues to, to direct people in um, and, and different ways to approach that. But for me, the, the reason that I do weddings over commercial for the most part is I love people. I love, mm -hmm. I love hearing stories. I love seeing the different cultures. I love seeing the different backgrounds and the way they blend together. Well, thank you again, Max, for, for spending some time with us and, and letting us uh, be inside of, of your world. And, uh, and I think this is definitely beneficial. I know there are a lot of people who want to learn uh, whether it's a specific type of photography you do or, or you know, a specific type of filmmaking that someone may do. Uh, but I think that process is a very important uh, thing to discuss because whether you're getting into it or you're into it, but you're doing it totally differently than how somebody else is doing it, it's always neat to get that input from someone else for sure yeah thanks for having me on i appreciate it and um love love partnering with you guys whenever i can yeah absolutely uh, how can our audience uh follow you on social media for sure so my instagram is grub w g r u b b w uh, facebook it's max grub weddings my website is max grub weddings um, and that's kind of the only ones that i'm on very cool. They can see your, they can see your signature. It's, they can see your style. Maybe get uh, inspired by what you've done. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the place to hear my voice for sure. Definitely. Uh, thank you all again for sticking with us. Uh, this is a really exciting time that we get to uh, get into the minds of these different image makers. And if there are any other questions or other people you'd like us to interview, please put it there in the comments. We want to know. Uh, as well as if you have any questions about some of the gear we talked about today, uh, reach out to us either in store or online at bedfords.com. We'd be glad to help you out. We'll see you next time.